Would it get you back to your seat faster? All right, I'm gonna start the introduction for our next speaker. I'm sure you all can't wait to hear about him. All right, I'm gonna start introducing Marcos Lopez. Our next speaker is a physical therapist from San Antonio, Texas. He is a board certified orthopedic clinical specialist. He completed the, ther completed the therapeutic pain specialist program through the International Spine and Pain Institute in the fall of 2016 and completed evidence in motions fellowship and manual physical therapy program in summer of 2019. Dr. Lopez has spoken at state and national conferences regarding physical therapy, integrating pain neuroscience, and evidence-based practice. He is a lecturer for modern pain care and facilitates their online mentorship program. He has served on various leadership positions within the Texas Physical Therapy Association at the district and state level. He practices in an outpatient orthopedic private practice and serves as the primary physical therapist in a substance abuse rehabilitation clinic called New Hope. His role with New Hope is to provide weekly group educational sessions on pain science and to provide physical therapy to treat their underlying pain conditions while they actively taper off of opioids. So I'd like to bring up Dr. Lopez. All right, guys. Can you guys hear me okay? So that, that doesn't really tell you anything about who I am, right? That just tells you what I've done. And it, there's a, an important piece of that, which is how I essentially got here. But before I tell you a little bit more about who I am, I want to know who's in this room. We haven't had that opportunity yet, and I think it's very important to recognize uh, you guys as well. Um, so first question is, who in this room is a prescribing provider? Raise your hand. Uh, uh, fair enough. Uh, the, the capacity to prescribe medicine, medications. <laughs> I see two. Um, who here is a conservative care provider? And that's your massage therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, your chiropractic, all the others. Okay. And then I'm also just curious, who here is from the United States? All right. And then the others, please raise your hand just so I could see it. That is awesome. That is so cool, awesome. Well, let me tell you a little bit about, about who I am. I, my name is Marcos Lopez, and I, I by no means am at the level of all the other presenters here. I'm thoroughly honored and pleased to be here. Um, and thank you, Rajam, wherever you are, for, for having me and giving me this platform to speak about something I'm extremely passionate about. I'm from El Paso, Texas. It's a community that is on the border of uh, Juarez, Mexico, El Paso, Texas. Uh, is the farthest west city in Texas. Now, because of that, for whatever reason, it's just a little slow with the times. Uh, anything from healthcare and everything in between, like entertainment, it's just, it's, it's behind the times. And I personally have experienced what I would call an injustice within the medical system in which I had uh, various injuries in high school and misdiagnosis, mismanagement that had me sidelined and unable to participate in the sports that I love, uh, which was football and track. <clears throat> now, I'm also um, in my community environmentally exposed to an underserved demographic and population. And, and I think that the environmental exposure that I had growing up within this community, as well as my own personal experience, is probably the fire behind the passion to fight against uh, injustice. And I think that's important for you guys to know, because it, to know a little bit more about me will help you better understand um, my motivations, my intentions, and, and, and part of the story that you're about to hear. 
Now, it is important for you guys to know how I got into this space, which was a big part of the introduction. I was in Dallas for about four and a half years, and I had the opportunity to move to San Antonio uh, to work with a, uh, a, a fellowship trained physical therapist that was going to help me complete my fellowship program. And within a couple months of being there, I've been there almost two years to this day, within a couple months of being there, the clinic director, his name is Andrew Bennett, he came out to me and he said, hey, I've got something for you. I'm talking with a uh, board certified uh, spine uh, surgeon who is opening up a practice called New Hope that their primary mission and vision is to taper off people uh, off of opioid medications. These are people who have a dependency or have opioid use disorder. Do you want to take this on? And I said, yes. I want to be involved at whatever capacity. Let's do this. So it, a lot of exploration, right? There isn't really much out there on how you work with these folks in the context of physical therapy or conservative care, and what is our role and how we can implement it, how can we make change? How can we serve against this injustice? And so I kind of just went for it. And I did as much, as much, as much research as I could. I read so much about what opioids are, how they function, how they impact people's lives, and then I tried to marry this idea of maybe a biopsychosocial kind of um, framework into how to work with these people. Now, New Hope is um, a multidisciplinary rehab center, and they have multiple services, counseling, medication management, and physical therapy. Now, the way that this works is that there's two programs within this, within this facility, the outpatient program and the intensive outpatient program. Now, in order to be placed in one or the other, it depends on where you fall in the category of opioid use disorder. And so I'm gonna read here a few of the DSM-5 signs and symptoms, which there are 11. And based on how many you have, it kind of matches you up with where you are with the disorder. <clears throat> one out of these 11 is the medication was taken at larger amounts and for a longer period of time. Another one is a persistent desire to use with unsuccessful efforts to cut down. Another one is withdrawal symptoms. Another one is tolerance. And then the other ones are the psychobehavioral issues, those um, symptoms uh, that are behavioral in nature. I, I cannot work without a strong desire to use the substance. I am missing work. I am missing family events. I am ruminating about the substance. The substance is taking over and in fact changing and altering behavior that is in the realm of harmful for the individual or the loved ones around them. So if you're in the outpatient program, it's four hours a week, one hour of a medication management visit where they're scheduling your taper, um, uh, three hours of counseling services, individual and group, and that makes up your four hours. And then in the intensive outpatient program, that's a 10-hour program, and that is one hour of medication management, and then it's the remainder nine hours of essentially counseling and um, part of what I do. Now, for, to be in the outpatient program, you fall under the classification of low, which means you have less than three of those signs and symptoms. Mind you, some of those symptoms are withdrawal, are tolerance, longer use uh, at larger amounts, which will be a theme later on. To be in the intensive outpatient program, which is 10 hours, that's moderate, which is four to five of the DSM-5 signs and symptoms and severe opioid use disorders classified as having more than six, okay? Now, before we get up to speed on the current state of the opioid epidemic, I do want to shed light on some historical uh, observations. This is uh, Dr. Albut in the Journal of Practitioner in 1870, and he quotes, does morphia tend to encourage the very pain it pretends to relieve? Experience is needed, and in the case in question, I have much reason to suspect that a reliance upon hypodermic morphia only ended in the curious state of perpetuated pain. Now, we all know pain is complex, right? We've been talking about that all day, 
And we all know that there's kind of this biopsychosocial way of understanding pain, impacting biology, psychology, and social factors. And there's no question in my mind that these drugs do have the ability to influence all three domains and facilitate perpetuated pain and suffering. <clears throat> so now to bring you up to speed on the current state of the opioid crisis and epidemic, and before we do that, I have a few questions for you. Who here has ever been prescribed an opioid? Please raise your hand. Who here has a family or friend who's been prescribed an opioid? Raise your hand. Who here knows someone who's dependent on opioids? Raise your hand. And who here knows someone who suffers from opioid use disorder and is addicted? <clears throat> so the current state is, is, is not great. 60% of overdose deaths are related to opioids. Americans consume greater than 80% of the world's hydrocodone, excuse me, of the world's opioids, and they uh, consume more than 99% uh, 99 of the hydrocodone prescribed. In 2015, $500 billion were spent in the US in relation to the opioid crisis and the opioid epidemic. Roughly 80% of heroin users started from a prescription pain medicine. Roughly 130 people die a day from opioid overdose deaths, and of those, 60 are linked to chronic pain. Every 25 minutes, a baby is born with needle natal abstinence syndrome. That is a condition in which they are suffering from opioid withdrawals. Think about Melanie's talk earlier in childhood experiences and childhood trauma and how that implicates that individual for the rest of their life. Lastly, in 2016, more than two million people were diagnosed with opioid use disorder, and that's just the folks that we're aware of. So now's probably a good time to talk about addiction and use disorder. The past belief was that it was an issue of moral fiber, moral compass. We have a choice to do these things, and we do these because we just have low moral fiber, whether it's taking uh, overusing a prescription medication, if it's smoking weed, if it's gambling, if it's sex, the idea was that you just had a low moral fiber, moral compass, and that it was your choice to engage. And because of that, hence all the stigma, shame, and blame that we probably implicitly place on some of these individuals, but also the fact that they place on themselves. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that is completely false. Now, as we're starting to understand addiction a little bit more, the current idea and the belief is that it is a uh, brain reward motivation risk circuitry issue, if you will. And usually there is environmental exposure and or some form of early life trauma that precipitated, an event that precipitated that change in that neural circuitry. Now, <clears throat> behavior, is motivated by incentives and rewards, and they're usually done in a way to facilitate survival, right? So if I'm hungry and I smell pumpkin pie, I am gonna eat it to satisfy my hunger. So the incentive is the smell of the pumpkin pie, or the incentive is the visual appearance of it. The motivation facilitates the behavior to eat. But what we need to remember, if you think of this biopsychosocial perspective, is all the contextual things that go into those associations. So for me, personally, pumpkin pie leads to very favorable family experiences. It reminds me of Thanksgiving. It reminds me of my loved ones. It reminds me of my family. It reminds me of laughter, joy. So every time I eat a piece of pumpkin pie, it facilitates those memories. And the response, the dopamine that hits, and the feel-good neurohormones that come in and the neurotransmitters that facilitate soothing are dumped. Now, what that also means is that all of those associations can then motivate behavior. And it's a concept called incentive sensitization. And it is somewhat familiar to that concept of central sensitization. But what happens here is that the incentive becomes so highly magnified that our ability to downregulate 
the exposure to that incentive is lost. And so instead of thinking that I need to have that pumpkin pie just to satisfy my hunger, that I want to have the pumpkin pie to satisfy my hunger, my biology starts to believe that I need that pumpkin pie to survive. That is how people then get stuck on these use disorders. Now, what I want you guys to do for me, play with me please, is I want you guys to close your eyes, okay? I know it's end of day. I know for some of you it's like two in the morning where you're originally from, but bear with me. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to take a deep breath in through your nose, out through your mouth. And I want you to do that again, in through your nose, out through your mouth. Now I want you to think of a loved one. It could be a family member, it could be a friend, it could be your spouse, it could be your kids, it could be your grandparents. And I want you to think to the feeling and the emotion that you get when you think of that individual. I want you to breathe one more time, in through your nose, out through your mouth, and you can open on the exhale and just think about that feeling or emotion for a second. So now, I want to tell you about a friend of mine, and her name is Debbie. Debbie is a 43-year-old mother of two, 11-year-old Emily and 6-year-old Jack. She's an avid Pinterester. I don't even know if that's a word, but I'm, I'm going to make that up, right? So she, like, loves being on Pinterest, loves doing arts and crafts, and she loves um, creating things. She's also a very avid hiker and loves the outdoors. <clears throat> now, she's also an orthopedic charge nurse. And so with that, I'm sure most of you are aware, comes uh, some cost. A physically taxing job, dysregulated sleep system or sleep schedules, high stress environment, and guess what? Her belief and understanding in pain is rooted in her profession and what she knows and loves to do. And her belief as a nurse is that if something hurts, A, I need to take medicine to make it feel better or for it to go away, or B, something is broke and probably needs fixing. Now, many years ago, Debbie gave birth to Emily, her firstborn, and it was then that she experienced her first lasting bout of back pain. Severe to the point where it was a burning sensation and crippling, it would almost take her breath away. Any time it hit, it paused her in her tracks. It was getting to the point where she was getting quite fearful and concerned about what it is is going on, and it's, so then the fear kicked in and she started to reduce her meaningful activities because she was fearful. Now, like many cases of low back pain, to Neil's point, is that they usually will get better, right? Over time, it gradually will get better and people are able to recover. Now, <clears throat> she's a new mother, so for her, she's managing and balancing the threats in her life. The priority is the safety and the well-being of her baby and trying to nurture and love, that, uh, love Emily versus the back pain that she's experiencing. <clears throat> I'm sure the parents in the room can relate, right? Once a newborn hits, comes into the world, sleep schedule, out the window, you're not sleeping as well, self-care goes probably through the roof, and you're just a little bit more stressed. So for us, it makes sense why the back pain probably persisted. Now, it's important, remember, that her pain is rooted in her understanding of it as a nurse. If something hurts, I should take medicine and it will feel better, or something is, must be broke and needs fixing. So several months pass and the pain persisted. Concerns and fears continue to rise, especially ready to return to work. She's getting back to go to work. So she visits her PCP. Now, her PCP, like most, has a busy practice and extremely well-intended. She wants to make sure that she does right by Debbie and gives her some relief. So, with this strong desire to give her some relief, she prescribes her hydrocodone. Now, she knows Debbie is a new mom, and she does not investigate the pain further. 
But I mean, why should she? It sounds fairly straightforward. Low back pain after having a baby. Now this is a very pivotal part of Debbie's story because her pain sounded relatively straightforward. Her PCP did not form a detailed physical exam, did not thoroughly assess for appropriateness for the use of medications, <clears throat> did not refer her to conservative care, and also did not assess for risk factors for the development of substance use disorder or opioid use disorder. And you see there are certain genetic and environmental factors that increase one's susceptibility to uh, use disorder. One of the most prominent ones is a personal or family history of use disorder. Now, Debbie's father was an alcoholic. <clears throat> Debbie herself had previously used marijuana in high school and in college. So she had a history of substance use. Another big factor is mental health. Depression and anxiety increase the risk of developing substance use disorder. Now, for Debbie, she had both, which was previously controlled with marijuana, but then more currently was being controlled with a benzodiazepam prescribed by a psychiatrist. Environmental factors that increase the risk for use disorder is ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. And what this is, this is physical, emotional, or sexual abuse or trauma in your adolescence, in your development, developmental uh, stages. Other forms of ACEs are living with someone who's been incarcerated, um, living with someone who has suicidal ideation, living with someone uh, who has a use disorder as well. These are these environmental and genetic factors that increase susceptibility to use disorder. Family dynamics also play a role here. Um, if your parents have been divorced or separated or there's some degree of isolation, these two fall in the realm of adverse uh, childhood experiences or adversity, which increase our susceptibility to use disorder. Now I ask you again, why would her PCP investigate these things? Right? To Neil's point, it's low back pain. It'll get better, right? Um, and maybe we don't know the exact treatment to do, but clearly hydrocodone is not, not the, the way to go. Now, fortunately for Debbie, her pain was able to get manageable, and she was able to return to work. And what would happen is on particularly busy days and stressful days, her pain would flare and she would soothe by taking a hydrocodone. <clears throat> some leftover that she had from her prescription. Now, several years have passed, and now Jack is born, and guess what? Her pain returns. Now, for us, this makes sense, right? Decreased sleep, decreased self-care, reduced physical activity, increased stress, and a strong neurotag for her association with the association of pain and childbirth. For Debbie, an all too familiar experience, however, this time it was harder to manage. Her sleep also had been progressively getting worse over the years because her husband had developed sleep apnea. And obviously having to be, uh, being a mother for Emily, she's uh, addressing additional stressors in life. Now with two kids, it's harder for her to take as much time off as she could during the first pregnancy, so she has to get back to work sooner. So there's financial concerns and stress associated at this point as well. But hey, she's been here before, and she somewhat overcame it, and she managed it. So she visits her PCP, same story, different time, prescribed hydrocodone again. However, this time, the meds are not as effective as they once were. She now has to take two to three to manage her pain. So Debbie like most, are unfamiliar or unaware with the side effects of opioids. You see the opioids have a strong tendency to develop tolerance. And for those of you coffee drinkers, right, tolerance is a, an issue in which you may start with one cup of coffee to get your day going, but you start to develop a physiological 
uh, adaptation and tolerance to the substance, so then it maybe takes two or three cups of coffee to get your day going. Opioids function the exact same way. Opioids have also been linked to produce a phenomenon called opioid-induced hyperalgesia. The hyperalgesia, for those of you that are unaware, if I flick you on the chin with a, with a consistent mechanical stimuli, right, the force is exactly the same, and typically it hurts you maybe a 2 out of 10 pain. I know we hate the number scale, but bear with me. And it hurts you a 2 out of 10. When you're experiencing a hyperalgesic response, that same mechanical stimuli, the same pressure, might be a 5 or a 6 out of 10. The pain is amplified and it's magnified. Now, opioid-induced hyperalgesia has been seen to be present more commonly in higher doses and after prolonged exposure. It happens at the site of your original injury, but then it also spreads diffusely throughout the body. So what ends up happening is that the nervous system or the individual starts to become less tolerant to physical demands, physical stressors, and non-physical stressors. Worst of all, dependence can occur after just five days of exposure. Now, dependence is a physiological adaptation, uh, almost reliance on the substance, and it's categorized by experiencing withdrawal symptoms once the substance is um, removed, once you discontinue use of the substance. <clears throat> so, Imagine, same thing with your coffee. If you don't have coffee for two or three days, you start to experience the headache, right? The caffeine headache or maybe the shivers. That's an example of a withdrawal symptom associated to the dependence to that substance, in this case, caffeine. You can only imagine the magnitude of the withdrawal symptoms associated to opioids. Now, Debbie's belief and perception of these experiences is similar to most. I must be broken, and something needs fixing. Why is it that now I need to take two or three pain pills instead of just one to manage my pain? Why is it now that I'm experiencing all these other symptoms throughout my body? Why is it now that I am less tolerant to physical demands and non-physical stressors? I must be wrong. Something must be broken. What's going on? Now, let's get, get into some context here. Think, think of anyone who's having a surgery. Whenever you're having a surgery, perioperatively, in conjunction with your anesthesia, you're given a bolus of remifentanil. Remifentanil is a synthetic opioid. Very, very strong. And the idea is that it's done in conjunction with the anesthesia to get ahead of the pain or control the pain upon waking. So you're already getting exposed to the opioid substance. Now, you wake after your surgery, and you're given a narcotic, typically morphine in a pump form, and you're recommended to take it every four hours, and, and in fact, to do it before the pain hits, to control the pain and to get ahead of it. <clears throat> Behaviorally speaking, think about what that does, what that is facilitating for individuals who are in pain. I am, not, I am not in control of it. I need a substance to take it, uh, to help alleviate it. Passive coping strategies and reducing self-efficacy, right? Now, the other thing that's important to note in this same operative case is, let's say the patient gets discharged after five days or maybe two days in the hospital. Let's, let's, let's call it two days. Now, the dose that is often prescribed is anywhere between 30, 60, and 90 pills to be taken every four to six hours which is a maximum dose to take for five days up to 15 days. Remember, it just takes five days of exposure to develop dependence. By the time patients get to us in the conservative care world after this experience, it is possible and likely that they have developed or experienced tolerance, opioid-induced hyperalgesia, and or dependence. Just think about that. Now, fortunately for Debbie, she's able to return to work. But this time, the pain is, is more and more severe. Now, as more and more surgeries are continued to be done in the United States, guess what? She is more and more busy, which means she's working longer hours. 
she's more stressed, and her pain is still persisting. If being a mom and a parent for two, being a spouse, being a nurse wasn't enough for someone, imagine doing that with persistent, severe pain. Now, Debbie, she was unable to do the things that she loved at this point. She felt like she was failing as a parent. Her working capacity was declining, and she was forgetting things. She was making mistakes. She did not feel present anymore in the world, and she felt as though she had lost her sense of self. She now has to take roughly 15 hydrocodone a day to manage her pain. That is equivalent to what is called, what is 75 MME, morphine measurable equivalents. They have developed this scale because there's so many versions of opioid drugs, synthetic, non-synthetic, that they needed a way to, to calculate and monitor dose. She was taking roughly 75 MME, which is the equivalent of 15 hydrocodone a day. Anything more than 50 MME increases your risk of overdose twofold. And if you're taking opioids in conjunction with a benzodiazepine, your, incre your risk of overdose increases as well. Now, fortunately for her, she has access to people who can prescribe, and she has access to medications, fortunately or unfortunately. So she was able to continue use. Now on July 17th, 2018, the physical, mental, emotional pain and suffering had reached the limit. She woke up, she took 20 hydrocodone, and then started getting dressed. This is the day that Debbie overdosed. So it was after this experience, fortunately for her, her husband was not too far. And her husband was able to call the medical uh, emergency services and they were able to bring her back. It was after this experience that she was referred to New Hope, uh, the facility that I ex uh, shared with you guys, that I work with. And at the, at the time that she had arrived to New Hope, she was taking roughly 100 MME a day to manage her pain which is the equivalent of 20 hydrocodone. Now, <clears throat> at New Hope, like I mentioned, there's three services provided. One is the medication management. People come in, they're seen on a weekly basis for a medication visit to be able to, as carefully as possible, try to wean them off of the opioid medication in a way that minimizes the withdrawal symptoms. The counseling services that are provided are phenomenal, and the head counselor is actually, coincidentally, a former patient of mine. Uh, her name is Alicia Scott, and she is phenomenal. But the counseling sessions are super important for these individuals because it is able to create an environment where you decrease stigma, you decrease judgment, and you facilitate trust. Now, in these counseling sessions, it's usually a great opportunity for them to unload life's stressors, right? What are the things that have been filling their cup that have their cup overflowing? Now, they also received the pain science, kind of pain coaching, uh, counseling, I can't call it counseling, group, which is the group that I run. One thing I forgot to mention is this group is the one and only group, one hour a week, every Thursday, 12.30 to 1.30, where both programs meet, meaning those that have opioid dependence and on the spectrum of low opioid use disorder are present, but also the ones in the intensive outpatient program that are classified as either having moderate or severe opioid use uh, disorder are present. So this is the largest group that we have. And in the past, I would work with these folks at my physical therapy clinic, which is called Texas Physical Therapy Specialist, and I would work with them there when they were actively tapering off, and then I would see them on a weekly basis, very ritualistically on Thursday. At this point, I'm no longer providing the physical therapy services for business reasons, which we don't need to get into, but I, I'm committed to them, even without pay, to see them every Thursday for an hour, 
and that's our group. And what we do in this group, the big thing is to draw awareness between the relationship with pain and use disorder. The primary concern of every single patient who walks through that door is an immense fear of what is gonna happen when you start taking me off this medications in the context of their pain. What is gonna happen to my pain? Number one concern. Primary concern number two common theme is why me? Why am I this way? So what do we do? So we do you know, kind of impromptu pain neuroscience education sessions, whatever you want to call it, but really what we're doing is we're establishing a common knowledge and a common language around pain, how it functions, pain and sensitivity, nervous system sensitivity. We, we do things like threats and safeties. We do Greg Lehman's overflowing metaphor cup. We do those types of things, and it's a few key components that lay down the foundation for how we're gonna to continue to engage and communicate as we move through. The other thing we do is we educate them on the OUD risk factors. Why am I this way? Why me? So giving them that knowledge is empowering for them to know that they're not defective, that they're not broken, that the reason why their pain spread could be contributed to opioid-induced hyperalgesia. The reason why they're less sensitive, more sensitive and less tolerant to physical and non-physical stressors could be a byproduct of a side effect of the medication. It could be all the other biopsychosocial factors associated to it, but they're able to draw an awareness and an understanding of why they had those experiences in the context of use disorder and in the context of the side effects with the medications. <clears throat> We also do behavioral experiments, and this is a neat opportunity to give them back control and to give them hope. So some of the things we do, and the aim of these is to reduce pain and reduce stress and help improve their load tolerance, their load capacity. So we'll do meditation. We'll do journaling. We'll go through pacing strategies. We'll go through graded activity. We'll try, now I can't, I, I can't treat these folks, right? I can't like do PT, but the idea is that we give them the knowledge and the strategies to take back control in a more active approach to be able to manage their stress and their pain, and then I hold them accountable to it. All right, Debbie, since you've been here, you're in bed 20 hours of the day. You hardly get out of bed, and when you do, you go to HEB because you have to, and guess what? You have a pain flare for two or three days. Why don't we just start by doing three minutes of walking? Can you do that for me? Do you think that's a doable, do you think that's a reasonable thing you could do? And guess what? As they start engaging with these behavioral experiments and finding that they can actually do that, you start to reap all the other benefits, and Debbie went from being in bed and bedridden, not being able to go to HEB, not being able to meal prep. She went from being able to then re-engage with her life, re-engage with her family and her friends. And in fact, Debbie was able to, to thrive and do pretty well. This is a picture of, of Debbie. Now this is at Eisenhower Park in San Antonio. Debbie's from San Antonio, and she used to hit this trail uh, when she was in high school. And she hadn't done it ever since. What you see in this picture is that moment, that aha moment, where she saw the light at the end of the tunnel. She was at this point on a very, very, very low dose. She was still on opiates, but on a very, very low dose. And she was starting to do very well. And she climbed this trail in the presence of her loved ones and completed it. And I remember getting a text literally immediately after, celebrating her successes and telling me what she just did. One thing I did forget to tell you about Debbie, and it's very relevant because I'm going to show you a text from her in a second, is she's extremely spiritual, extremely spiritual, but she is not afraid to curse and call you out on your bullshit. And You'll see what I mean here with the cursing in a second. <clears throat> this is Debbie, seven months into sobriety. 
This is at the Garden of the Gods outside of uh, Denver. And she was able to do this with her husband and uh, did it all while living well with pain. Now, one thing I want you to know is that this, this is a battle. This is not easy, and it's not going to get easier for her. In fact, it will probably be, continue to get harder, and over time, she's going to hit some bumps in the road. Remember that idea of incentive sensitization. Any association that can draw a physiological, neurobiological uh, desire to use the substance can set her off, and that could be pain as well. So literally, last Saturday, is today Saturday? A week ago, Debbie texted Alicia, and Alicia screenshotted it and texted me. So I have the flu and pneumonia. I woke up at 3 a.m. with the chills, and everything fucking aches. I got Tamiflu and a Z-Pack, so I know I'll start feeling better. But Alicia, what I wouldn't give for a Hydro or a Norco. I haven't felt this bad in a long time. I could do either or, but this is a double whammy for me. But... February 25th will be my one year of sobriety, and my heart and soul doesn't want to fuck that up. I've worked so hard for it. Bad. God. But, God, my body wants it so bad. Now, as conservative care providers, we are in the ideal space to help fight this issue. We often have the most time to perform comprehensive health screenings, thorough physical exams, and time to establish trust and relationships with our patients. It is through the ritual that we can provide hope for those suffering from OUD and I believe be able to help prevent those that are susceptible to developing OUD. So I have a call to action for everyone in this room, everyone listening as well. We need to start screening our patients to determine if they are at risk for developing OUD and make it common knowledge when we identify those that are, even if they have yet to be prescribed opioids. This is the opioid risk tool, OUD. And what you see there is that the lower the score, score of two or lower, indicates low risk for future opioid use disorder, and a score of three or greater has a high risk of opioid use disorder. That's Debbie's score and screen. So now I want you guys, if you will, close your eyes for me one more time. Think about that loved one you thought about earlier, and I want you to ask yourself if they're at risk. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so we do have a couple of questions. Sweet. All right, starting down. Um, okay, so from Sandy Hilton. What, what would you recommend those with unregulated, or yeah, unregulated chronic pain do when that pain is not well managed instead of a medication when there is no program accessible? The pain is too high to tolerate non-pharmacological -pharma, um, options. So if is, I think there's, are there two parts to that question? Question one is those with unregulated chronic pain. Great. So for those people who are using opioids and have no help coming off of them, and can't just go exercise, what would you recommend? Yeah, I'm that, gonna repeat that real quick for the, the parties at home and in the back of the room. Um, is that basically, so in the case when someone is having unregulated pain, pain that is not um, necessarily responding to non-pharmacological options. Um, what do we do with those people when there's no program like New Hope? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I'm fortunate to be connected with this group, and there are multiple resources that I've been able to find um, of uh, online-based uh, counseling services, as well as online-based um, pain management services. And there's... Um, there's funding for individuals. I, I emailed Rajam 
uh, some resources for, for you guys. I think she said she emailed it to you guys yesterday, but in that resource, um, there's resources, at least in the States, there's resources for funding programs, scholarships, sponsorships. If you identify someone who has a need for it, um, they can get involved there. Um, Beth Darnell has a great um, book or two that are self-paced, self-management strategies, so if you don't have access to the, the full-blown counseling services. The other thing, too, that, that I want everyone to, to know is that, I mean, we're, we're all the pain science people, right? Like, most of, most of what is done, yes, is counseling, but we have a role in that with the educational piece in drawing awareness to these things as well that I think um, is, is a part where we could step into. All right, next question coming from Jamie Lowy. Got that. Okay, Marcos, can you speak to the historical racial disparities with opioid use that was seen from the 1960s through, through 2000 in which um, people of color could not access care services versus the crisis status that developed once the issue impacted white communities in the U.S.? Dude, I'm not a sociologist, man. <laughs> uh, I mean, honestly, I, I don't even know where to begin how to answer that question. I apologize. Yeah, we could maybe chat over beers, and I could start to think a little bit more clearly after a beer, but I don't know, man. That's tough. Yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah, cool. Just awesome. could, could I ask, like, if, if you look at your clinic, do you see a wide variety of different socioeconomic and cultural and ethnic backgrounds, or um, is it pretty heterogeneous? Yes, we do, and, and most, most of the participants at New Hope are, are, are clients or patients are women, um, but we get all ages, and we do get different socioeconomic um, backgrounds as well. Um, I think the, the youngest gal was in her early 20s, and she was a recovering heroin addict, um, and then we had a gal who was like uh, in her late 70s, um, so you, you, you do get a range, yeah. <clears throat> okay, and then we have a question from Sharna. Um, oh, let me get it. The pain group that you teach, is it a one-time class or is it ongoing? And if ongoing, how many weeks? Do you have any data um, on the effectiveness and the efficacy, efficiency and efficacy? I'll throw that in there, of yeah. your classes. So that, that's a great question, and that's part of this idea. Is everyone familiar with what common knowledge is? Do you guys familiar with that term? I'm seeing like blank. So yeah, it, co common knowledge is, is you know that I know that you know something and vice versa, right? So part of what I have to do is, is I have created a framework, like um, kind of like an outline, if you will, or an overview of hitting some of these primary topics. On a given week, there could be a new person enrolled and there could be people that have been enrolled in the intens intensive outpatient program for eight months. Um, so there always has to be some um, redundancy for, mo for that reason, but also, guys, these people are on such high doses of opioids, I could tell them my name and 20 minutes later they forgot it. Uh, I could tell them something and four months from now, even though I've told it to them or we've reviewed it or we've talked about it, they're like, oh, that's the first time you've told me that or shared that with us. They, they, they are they're doped up on the medication, and we all know that pain decreases executive function, right? Like, you, like you, you got pain plus the meds. The disparity is, is, is pretty profound, too, that we have individuals who are on 50 MME. Remember, 75 MME is five milligrams, 15 hydrocodone. We've had people that are on 1,200 MME. I don't even, like, so to answer the, the, the question, it is, Every week, every Thursday, 12.30 to 1.30, there is redundancy within a framework that I'm, I'm working on. My goal for this year is to try to make that scalable so that I could, you know, we could maybe do an online four-hour course and I can give you guys insight on the things that have been successful for us. The only data that I have is I did measure um, uh, pain catastrophizing, uh, kinesiophobia, and I measured it. Uh, pre and post every single session with the framework foundational four sessions to establish that common knowledge. And what we found in these groups is that there was inter 
intra and intercession changes specifically for their pain catastrophization. And if you guys read in your notes that I sent you guys, that Rajam sent you guys, what you guys will find is that with some of Beth Darnell's work, pain catastrophizing a score greater than 10 is um, a, a risk factor, if you will, of developing uh, opioid use disorder. Um, and it used to be thought that the scores needed to be higher, and, and there's a paper she did, I think, in 2017 that um, is probably in there. So I measured pain catastrophizing in, in kinesiophobia, and there were some uh, successful um, outcomes with that specifically, uh, exceeding MCIDs, yeah. Okay, we have two more questions. We'll see if we have time for them. Uh, the next one is from Michelle Oren. How do you best bridge the gap to your patients who perceive you as unable to relate to their need for pharmaceuticals due to socioeconomic presumptions? Can we add clarity? Is Michelle here? Can you stand up? What do you mean socioeconomic presumptions? Okay, I'm going to rep repeat that real yeah. quick, and I'm going to summarize. So tell me, like, give me a, uh, uh if I don't get it right. Um, is that basically, it, it, sometimes in your practice, there are people who appear to kind of give off the perception that you're not getting it because you're a graduate, you're a PT, you're educated, maybe because you're white, like, that, they're, that they feel like you're not getting it. So how do you handle that feeling? Um, I think... There's a couple things that come to mind. One is it's, it's not easy and it's an art, right? Like it's all about the trust and the alliance with the patient, um, which is why I think we're in the ideal space. If you're PT, OT, massage therapist, we spend the most time so we can establish that trust. Two, I think it's making it common knowledge and letting them know that no one is immune to this, that this is affecting all levels of socioeconomic status. Um, whether across the world. So in essence, you know, you normalize the pain experience, well you also normalize this because it, it, in our current state of the world, it is normal to be on prescribed uh, these medications. And I think um, the other piece too is, um, oh man, it might have left me. But hopefully that satisfied your answer, or your question. Yeah, so the question is when to introduce the screening tool. So the way, that, the way that my practice functions is that I personally review screening tools with, with patients. I don't have them do it on their own in the waiting room. I don't, you, you know what I mean? I literally sit there with them and I ask them, have you ever been diagnosed by a medical provider with, with cancer, with high blood pressure, with diabetes, with depression, with anxiety? So I review that with them. So for me, I do a little, just a little variant of the tool. I don't use the tool itself because I know what the factors are. So it's built into my medical screening as I'm going through past medical history screening and I just simply ask if they have a history of use disorder or a family member or friend that has use disorder. And then you've got those two factors plus the age, plus the mental health issues, um, which are, which are the, the most predictive. So early on to answer your question, it's right off the jump. Because I view it as a, as a health screen. It's, it's not a blame, shame, guilt question. It's I want to know so that I can best manage you and prevent any further harm within you that could become on from the medical system. I want to know these things and here's why. That's that idea of the common knowledge. I'm asking these questions because I want to make sure that if you're at risk, I want you to know that you're at risk. So the next time your back pain flares and you go to the ER, 61% or 60% of people are gonna get prescribed opioids. I want you to be in control and say, hey, I am at risk based on this tool that my physio, my chiro, my PA, my whoever told me. So it gives the control back to the patient. That's, that's the idea. All right, then we have time for one more from Vicki Winston. 
Do you meet with the treatment team for those patients? And if so, what is the professional makeup of that team? <clears throat> so, uh, short answer is no. Um, we were in partner, we were trying to partner with New Hope, and the idea was that I was going to be on site treating patients, and it would function more like a, a multidisciplinary team approach. But long story short, business partners couldn't meet, and so I committed to essentially to Alicia, uh, who's a friend of mine, and I was invested in these folks, that I just show up, and I, I don't have any say, lay of the land, but they, they've entrusted in me and have given me the authority to do so. So short answer is no, that's the long answer. Okay, so now we're up to our next break. Um, so again, it's gonna be 15 minutes, and then we will come back at 5.30 for our last speaker. Thank you, guys.